Hello, and welcome to Chabot News for October 5th, 2022. My name is Jonathan II, and today we will be covering an announcement on President Biden in Puerto Rico, Ed Sheeran's new album, unfortunately, a fatal car crash, and a smart sprinkler controller. All that and more coming up on Chabot News. In recent news, Puerto Rico's latest storm has President Biden announcing $60 million to funding to shore up leaves and flood walls and to develop new flood warning systems to help residents better prepare for future storms. Dr. Maria, Congress approved billions of dollars for Puerto Rico, much of it not having gotten here initially. We're going to make sure you get every single dollar promised. We have to ensure that when the next hurricane strikes, Puerto Rico is ready, Biden said, during his remarks at the Port of Ponce. We send our thoughts and our prayers to all of those in Puerto Rico who are affected at this time, and we want to thank all of the individuals who are diligently sending aid their way. This current hurricane's name is Fiona, and according to Biden, this isn't the first time that the people of Puerto Rico have been swept up by a storm. Let us not forget about Hurricane Maria in 2017. Through these disasters, so many have been displaced from their homes, lost their jobs and or savings, and suffered injuries. Often unseen, but many times seen. But somehow the people of Puerto Rico keep getting back up and remain resilient and determined, he remarked. After Maria, Congress approved billions of dollars to Puerto Rico. Much of it not really got in there initially, but we're going to make sure you get every single dollar promised. The Ponce region experienced significant storm damage and power had been restored for 86% of residents there as of Sunday evening. We've been trying like hell to catch up from the last hurricane. I want to see the state of affairs today and make sure we push everything we can. The president will also travel to Florida this Wednesday where he will survey damages from Hurricane Ian. All but a few of San Francisco International's airports, restaurants, bars, Coffee shops and lounges have closed following a general strike declared by 1,000 of the airport's food service workers. SFO's food service workers have been in negotiations with the airport's restaurant employee council for nine months, fighting for higher wages and a continuation of their current health care benefits. James Torres from KTVU Fox 2 News reports as follows. More than a thousand workers here spread out at the airport. We're just in front of Terminal 2 this morning near the Alaska Airlines entrance, but protests are happening at nearly every terminal this morning. Nearly a thousand people. They've all been here since about 2 a.m. today, and this is affecting the employees of restaurants inside the airport. Their message to you this morning, if you plan to come and eat here before your flight, they say you'll need to bring your own meal. People out here striking this morning say they haven't had a working contract since 2019. They haven't had a raise since before then. The union representing these workers say they have made no uh, progress with negotiations and they are asking essentially for better pay. Most people here are earning minimum wage at about $17 an hour. And in order to make ends meet, several employees are getting second or even third jobs. It's an open-ended strike. We um, were showing employers that you know, we're frustrated with the progress in negotiations. There's been very little progress. We've been at the table for nine months um, trying to bargain for a new contract. Protest is affecting nearly every restaurant in the airport. Those on strike include cashiers, bartenders, cooks, servers, dishwashers, pretty much every position that you can think of that would help run a restaurant or a bar. Let's take you back live out here outside of SFO. Again, this is outside of Terminal 2. You see about a couple dozen workers, restaurant workers, bartender workers holding these signs that say on strike at SFO restaurants. Again, they've been here since early this morning, an open-ended strike, so no end in sight. They won't put this to end until they get better progress in their negotiations. We did hear from the airport offering a statement this morning, essentially warning those airline travelers, saying service at airport food courts and cafeterias will be limited. Again, if you wanted to eat, they're telling you to bring your own meal. Workers are prepared to strike for as long as it takes to enact the necessary changes. 
A woman who was critically injured in a horrific crash in North San Jose last week has died from her injuries. According to the officers, the crash took place on September 22nd at the intersection of Capitol Avenue and Berryessa Road. Several vehicles were involved and one of the vehicles rolled over in the crash. An adult woman was hospitalized in critical condition, police said. Wednesday, she had succumbed to her injuries. Her identity was not released, but according to officers, the driver was involved in a three separate hit and run collisions in San Jose and Milpitas that took place over the span of one hour. The woman's truck and trailer sideswiped a minivan. The truck then left the roadway and collided with a tree. The trailer then jackknifed and the lead truck on the trailer broke loose, rolling on top of the towing truck. A picture posted by San Jose police shortly after the crash showed a pickup truck that rolled over and another pickup truck with extensive front end damage. East Bay father speaks out after he and five year old son hit by a car crashing into Trader Joe's on September 5th around 3 to 4 p.m. Father and son were hit by a man who crashed his car into the Trader Joe's in Castro Valley. Ledesma said he and his children were at the check stand having just paid for their groceries when he heard a loud revening sound from a car outside. The father suffers from a severe ankle sprain and fractured left knee. His son Benjamin needed emergency surgery the night of the crash. His injuries include a broken right hip, a left shoulder, and a broken pelvis. He may need surgery for a severe tire burn as well on his left thigh. He is now in a wheelchair, and fortunately, Ledsma's 11-year-old daughter, CL, was not in the path of the car. California Highway Patrol said a total of eight people were injured. Some were struck by items that were sent flying by the crash after the accident. The father mentioned that he'd like to see the stores make changes that will make better protection for all of his customers. But most of all, he's grateful that he and his son, along with the other victims, survived the crash. Father and son are recuperating from their injuries at their home in Hayward. Ledesma says he was initially hospitalized for two days and Benjamin, sent, and Benjamin spent five days in the hospital. The driver who crashed his car into the Trader Joe's was driving at an unsafe speed, made an unsafe turn, and the pedal confusion played a role in his crash. CHP said the 90-year-old has been referred to DMV for an evaluation of his driving abilities. He was not cited and will not face criminal charges. Hayward offers discounted smart sprinkler controllers amidst drought despite the recent rain. California's drought continues and stage 2 water shortage restrictions remain in effect including limiting residential irrigation to three evenings per week. To assist, the city recently added the Ratio 3 Smart Irrigation Controller to its suite of conservation incentive programs, providing Hayward customers a $180 discount on the normally $280 device. The Ratio 3 Smart Irrigation Controller is compatible with most sprinkler systems and boasts average saving of 20% to 30% on customer water bills by automatically turning your system off based on need. It can also be used to create tailored schedules and make automatic weather adjustments to keep in line with Hayward's current water use restrictions. Additionally, it provides the ability to control your sprinklers from your mobile device or other smart technologies like Amazon Alexa, Google Assistant, Apple HomeKit, Nest, and more. New Mochi Nut opened up in San Leandro. For those of you who don't know what mochi donuts are, they are a fusion pastry crossing to they are a fusion pastry crossing traditional American donuts and Japanese mochi. Mochi Nut has been Mochi Nut has up to 25 different donut flavors, and they also offer drinks, soft serve, and hot dog. They are open seven days a week from 11 to 11.30 to 8 p.m. and close 9 p.m. on Friday and Saturday. And make sure to stop by to try out amazing mochi donut. 
And now we go to Hamza with his entertainment report. Thanks, Jonathan. Kim Kardashian agreed to pay a $1.26 million fine to the Securities and Exchange Commission. The payment settled civil charges after the reality TV star touted a crypto asset on Instagram. She also agreed to cooperate with the SEC's ongoing investigation and not promote any crypto securities for three years. The SEC charged Kim Kardashians with failure to disclose that she was paid $250,000 to publish her post, violating the anti-touting provision of the federal security laws. She agreed to the order without admitting or denying the findings. The SEC chair said the case is a reminder that when celebrities or influencers endorse investment opportunities, it doesn't mean those investment products are right for all investors. Kardashian's attorneys said she fully cooperated with the SEC from the very beginning, and the agreement allows her to avoid a protracted dispute so she can move forward with her, her many different business pursuits. You're gonna have to remember, you're gonna have to remember your order of operations if you want what's sure to be one of the hottest, hottest tickets next summer. Using a series of mathematical symbols, Ed Sheeran announced a new tour, an ode to the singer-songwriter's album title. He's calling it the Mathematics Tour. It all adds up for, to the first time the singer-songwriter will pay, play stadiums in the U.S. in about five years. The tour kicks off on May 6th and it includes 21 dates. Jonathan, have you got anything else? As a matter of fact, Hamza, I do. In other entertainment news, congratulations to one of R&B's most talented composers and songstresses, Miss Solange Knowles. Miss Knowles debuted her original composition for the New York City Ballet on Wednesday, becoming only the second black woman to do so after Lido Pimenta in 2021. According to a media representative for the ballet, talk about groundbreaking. Breaking barriers in the music industry for black women is an uphill journey, and we are so excited to share this news with all of you. Even Beyonce celebrated her sister's accomplishments and her artistry in an Instagram post over the weekend, captioning, my beloved sister, there are no words to express the pride and admiration I have for you. You are a visionary and one of, and one of you. Beyonce wrote, the piece you composed is phenomenal. I love you deeply. In her collaboration with the ballet, Solange composed the work for dancer and choreographer Geniana Risen, a multidisciplinary artist. Solange's music has historically been complemented by stunning videos and films, like her 2019 visual album, When I Get Home. With both sisters producing fire content and media for our concepts, with both sisters producing fire content and media for our consumption, I think we can all agree that they make one proud family. And now we go to Jovelle for this week's Sports Report. Thanks, Jonathan. In sports news this week, Pittsburgh police detectives are investigating the death of a football fan after the game of the Steelers. Sunday, a man died after apparently falling off an escalator at Eskshore Stadium just after the game against the New York Jets. Paramedics worked to save the man on site and he was transported to local hospital in critical condition. According to Pittsburgh police, the man later died from his injuries. The stadium has a capacity of more than 68,000 and is home to both the Steelers and the University of Pittsburgh football team. Our prayers go out to the family. Also today in sports, California high school football team forfeited a game over the weekend as the district investigated video of players acting out a slave auction in a locker room. The now deleted TikTok video shows about a dozen students pointing and yelling dollar amounts at three black students standing in their underwear up against the wall. Danika Hill has the story. It's just sad. It really is sad because it's like, we're all equal. We're Cassandra all Munez all was a senior at River Valley High School just last year. Now her younger brother is a student at the school. It really sucks. We are in 2022, about to go to 2023, and this is still happening. And it, and it, it sucks because it's like we are showing 
other generations that are going to be coming up and they're going to think this is okay when it's not okay. This is not okay. The Yuba City Unified District Superintendent releasing this statement saying district and site administration received a copy of a recording of River Valley High School football team members acting out a reprehensible act of a slave auction. At this time, we are investigating the situation to determine which players were involved and to offer our support and sincere regard for the humiliation and anger that this must be causing. This week's game against Wood Creek has been forfeited. The superintendent's statement goes on to say they will be working on training that the athletic team requires in order to act with character and dignity at all times. They need counseling or something, whatever. We can help them with, but this should not happen. It's yeah. not good. Whoever made the video, I feel like they should. Even if they're football players, I don't care. You either have to get kicked off the game or, you know, don't even play for the rest of the season because that's messed up. The CIF is also responding to the incident. We spoke with media relations officer Rebecca Bertleg today. The CIF supports the decision of the River Valley administrators and the Yuba City Unified School District to promptly address the misconduct of their students. Discrimination in any form or any acts that are disrespectful or demeaning are unacceptable and are not consistent with the principles of the CIF. The team now has to forfeit the rest of its games. <clears throat> this season because it does not have enough players after several of the players involved were told they could not play anymore. That is all for sports this week. Now back to you, Jonathan. Thanks, Jovelle. And finally, this week, a romantic date on Boston's Charles River took a bad turn when a smartphone fell into the water. The effort to dive in and retrieve the expensive phone turned up 11 phones in all but not the one that they were looking for. As Brandon Triet reports, the story still has a happy ending. John and Astos and Jennifer Abramson are still figuring each other out. The two most recently met Tuesday for an evening on the Charles. It was their third date. Suggested the two paddle boards, taking them out on the Charles at night and look at the Boston lights. It was all going so well until it was time to dock here in Cambridge. John's phone got a little close to the edge. I don't know if it was with my hand, my foot, my leg, but while I was getting my paddle board out, kicked my phone into the water and just watched it sink. And I was like, oh, you gotta be kidding me. And so began those moments of contemplation. We all know that feeling, to take action or just let it go. Using paddles to determine the water was about 15 feet deep. John went for it. He jumped into the Charles. You don't just hit the bottom. It's kind of more like slowly you ooze into the bottom. <laughs> If he had lived here in the 80s and 90s, he would not have jumped in. On his first jump, John felt two phones. He did six more jumps and recovered a total of 11. It wasn't until the next morning when John thought to see if any of the phones would work. Plugging them in one by one, three of them did turn on. And using the phone's emergency contact information, he started tracking down the original owners. I remember it. It's obviously a little embarrassing, especially considering where I work. <laughs> One of them belongs to Deb Laufer. She works for Paddle Boston and lost her phone last month in the same spot John did. Hers was in a watertight bag. Unclear if she's more impressed that the phone still works or by how it was recovered. Yeah, surprised. Surprised that anyone was willing to, to dive in off that dock, for sure. For his part, John guesses dozens more devices are down there. After all that work, he never found his own phone. And in case anyone's down there. Yeah, it's a Samsung with me and two little kids. A date night with an unexpected dive, fishing out phones and securing the fourth date. In Cambridge, Brandon Truett, WBZ News. Thanks, Brandon. Remember to always keep your phone in a safe place when on the water. That's all for Chabot News this week. Thanks to all the students and staff in the Mass Communications Department here at Chabot College for making this production possible. You can also watch us anytime online at youtube.com slash Chabot TV. Stay tuned to KCTH Channel 27 for more Chabot TV. Peace, y'all.